you know, I answer your question in two ways. Um, I think uh, like many uh, new technologies that are surrounded by lots of hype, it often becomes difficult to uh, distinguish what's real versus what's not. Uh, to be able to uh, take words that originally meant uh, one thing and then have been diluted to mean something else. So I'll start by saying we can parse those three terms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Um, if you talk to the you know, very deep technical researchers, you know, they can debate for hours what the distinction is, you know, what is really artificial intelligence, how is machine learning different, uh, but even they uh, have a hard time agreeing and coming up with clear definitions. The way that I think about it is I think of artificial intelligence as the broad field. It's the broad field of trying to teach uh, computers to think and reason around data the way a human being might. And that's a very broad field. It can encompass anything from robotics to speech uh, and other forms of, of uh, computer-aided techniques that you hear about uh, in the world. I think machine learning is really a subset of that. And it's the more pragmatic implementation of effectively teaching the computers to identify very complex patterns in large amounts of data. And the distinction between you know, machine learning and deep learning is even more subtle and frankly of less concern than me. Uh, the people describe the, the difference there uh, within the technical community as the distinction of whether you need to do uh, human generated what's called feature engineering is thinking about how do I define what variables might be important within this model versus again within the, the world of deep learning what the the innovation there was effectively taking away the need for that is that the computers or the algorithms applied by these computers were really uncovering all of those complex relationships and that can have pros and cons uh, in certain fields, things like computer vision, which is where uh, deep learning first made its big impact, that's okay. Uh, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to classify images. You're trying to understand is something a dog versus a cat. And you don't necessarily need to understand why uh, an image was classified as a dog versus cat. You just need to verify that that was the case. There's other fields, though, where interpretability and understanding why decisions are being made within these contexts is very important. And the classical machine learning techniques uh, are very useful for that and are very important. I think it's a couple things. Um, if you look at, and exactly as you said, machine learning as a concept isn't new. I think the coin was originally phrased in the mid-1950s, and it's gone through several boom and bust cycles uh, under different names over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, why now is a question. Um, if you look back historically, uh, these techniques, and machine, relearn machine learning relies on a couple of things. First and foremost, uh, it relies upon and is most effective in applications or in regimes that have very, very large amounts of data. And so if you look at the last 10 years or so, the boom in uh, you know, big data type technologies, and in particular, cloud-based storage of those big data, big data technologies, and in particular, acquisition of metrics coming off things like cell phones and SaaS applications that are stored in the cloud in big data tech technologies, there is now more data available than ever upon which to apply those machine learning technologies, as well as that's needed to be able to interpret and understand what's going on in that data. That's number one. Number two is, if you look back historically, the algorithms that are used in machine learning techniques are extremely computationally intensive. And so five or 10 years ago, the big bottleneck in the application or the implementation of a machine learning system was how efficient and how accurate was my algorithm and how much computational power was required to apply that to a reasonable amount of data. And so 10 years ago, you had lots of people putting effort into making those algorithms more efficient, uh, making distributed computing and high performance computing within the cloud more efficient to be able to then apply to this data. So the confluence of those two things have really matured. Uh, you've had an aggregation of very large amounts of data and you've had a maturation and really an efficiency of the algorithms and computational techniques that can be applied to that data. 
as a result, we've had those capabilities start to seep into our daily lives. Um, things like Amazon with Alexa is using large amounts of data and very sophisticated machine learning to understand our queries in voice-based form as to what we might ask uh, a system. Uh, we think about it uh, and we sometimes don't even notice it on a day-to-day -day basis using our email if we're uh, Gmail users. Our inboxes are cleaner than ever without losing important email because Google has applied very sophisticated machine learning to spam filtering within that. And so over and over and again in our daily lives, in our personal lives on the consumer side of the world, we started to see those technologies make an impact and drive better user experience, more efficiency and more value for those, those companies. What we're seeing now in the industrial space is a realization that the same opportunity is there. And so that's starting to happen uh, with the ac applications to acquire and understand the use of data in industrial applications. And then very naturally, we will apply machine learning and AI techniques to those, just like has existed in the consumer-facing world.